I'm Joe Chamberlain, Executive Director of the Coastside Land Trust, and our organization is delighted to present the, th the third webinar of a three-part series presented by Professor Daniel Costa with UC Santa Cruz on marine mammals. Today's topic is North American seals from the beach to the sea. I know that Dan has done extensive uh, research on these animals and has opened a window into what happens when these animals disappear from our views. You will have an opportunity to ask questions by typing into the question box at the bottom of your screen. And we will address as many of those at the end as we possibly can. So I welcome you and again, really thank you, Dr. Costa. Please share what you can with us today. All right, are we good to go? Hi, welcome to uh, the last in a series of our talks. I'm gonna share with you today work that has taken out, been ongoing for quite some time uh, on Northern elephant seals. I started at Santa Cruz as a graduate student in the early, in the late seventies. At that time, Bernie LaBeouf was, had started the elephant seal program in the early seventies. And I like this talk because at the time, all we did was study what was happening on the beach. And, and it's not like that is an end, dead end. We're still doing lots of uh, research on elephant seal behavior on the beach, elephant seal physiology, everything they do in terms of fasting. They're an incredible animal. But today I'm going to talk about what they do at sea. And it, it follows on the lecture I gave last week, last weekend, that discussed all the new tools and approaches. And that's really a, an undercarriage of this talk today because it's all these new instrumentation and all these new tools that have allowed us to gain the insight into what these animals do thousands of miles away from the beach. So whenever you talk about elephant seals, you have to give the background. And, and especially with all of the environmental catastrophes and, and all of the things we hear, uh, the, the bad stories, the doom and gloom, elephant seals are one of those stories that's just an amazing, amazing recovery. In eight, elephant seals were harvested for their oil. A lot of the, the whaling vessels in the early 1800s through the 1800s would come when they came into the Pacific to whale, they would often stop at the breeding islands of Northern elephant seals and they'd knock off elephant seals that they did at the right time of the year, which would be January, February, March. And then during the, the molting season, they could kill elephant seals easily because they didn't, elephant seals aren't afraid of people. And they would fill up their, their kegs of oil and then take them back to the East Coast. And so it was a very easy way to fill off the tanks of, of fill up their, their barrels of oil. As a result, in 1896, we had thought that elephant seals were extinct. We had not seen them anywhere in their in range, in normal range. But in 1896, the Townsend Expedition came to this island, Guadalupe Island, which is right here about 100 miles off the coast of Baja, California. And at that time they found 12 elephant seals. And one of the great lines from that report was, although it was sad for the elephant seal, the thirst of science must be quenched. And because in those days, if you saw an animal you thought was extinct, you needed to collect it to put it into a museum. So they shot all 12 elephant seals they found on the beach and, and loading them onto the to the ship, the research vessel, they lost half of them. And so we thought elephant seals were, that was it. We don't know how many animals were left on the beach, but we estimate from genetics that there was something on the order of less than 25 individuals or maybe around 25, which also means that all modern Northern elephant seals may have had one uh, adult male. Elephant seals have a highly polygynous breeding system. So it's entirely conceivable that all the elephant seals we know of today are emanated from one male father uh, in the late 1800s. In about 1911 or so, uh, Mexico declared them a protected species. Uh, people recognized that there were still a few elephant seals around and they the Mexican government protected them. So from, 18, from the early 1900s, elephant seals were first on Isla Guadalupe and today they've recovered to where well over 250,000 individuals. 
So the breeding colonies are here on Isla Guadalupe, the founder population, Isla San Benitos, San Nicolas Island, Santa Rosa and San Miguel. San Miguel and San Nicolas are the largest is where most of the elephant seals population currently exists. Population off Pedros Blancas, a little one off Gorda. Anya Nuevo is where, is actually a rather small population of uh, an island population compared to, to, to down here. There's some at Point Reyes and they're moving north now. There's some off of breeding colony uh, up around Humboldt, Humboldt County and off Vancouver Island in Canada. So that sort of is the backdrop of, of this amazing animal. And the same thing happened in the Southern, uh, Southern Ocean for Southern elephant seals, but they never got to the same uh, lower level and they had uh, multiple islands where elephants, Southern elephant seals were covered from. So that brings us to Año Nuevo. As I said, as a part of the breeding population, Año Nuevo is a very small island in terms of the numbers of elephant seals, but its proximity to Santa Cruz, to the University of California at Santa Cruz is amazing. It's a, it's a 20 minute drive for us to go up to, uh, to, to our research here at Año Nuevo. And it's part of the state park system. And Año Nuevo was actually reserved within the state parks, the California Department of uh, Parks and Recreation. And it's part of the UC Natural Reserve, uh, Natural Reserve System, which is a system-wide program of some 38 different pieces of property within California, some owned by the university, some uh, with a shared, we have an MOU with the state parks or National Park Service. In the 70s, we, when we worked on elephant seals, we had to do all our work at Año Nuevo because that's where the breeding took place. In 1976, the first female gave birth on the mainland and then the next year, there was three females that gave birth, the next year, six. And today we have most of our animals are breeding on the mainland. And so we work from about this whole section of the beach is a breeding uh, colony. And that's where we do our work, most of our work today. And we only rarely go out to the island because it logistically, it's a lot more work to get into a small boat, get into your wetsuits, drive out to the island. And most of the animals are now on the mainland. This just gives you uh, the numbers I just talked about. Uh, in breeding, the animals were first seen at Año Nuevo about 1963. As I said, the first pup was born in the mainland around uh, 1975, 76. Today, there's over 2,000 uh, pups born on, or 2,000, over 2,300 animals weaned. Uh, most of them, as I said, 1,900 on the mainland and, and about 450, 500 on the island. So what is the breeding pattern? What is the life cycle of elephant seals? So females come ashore pregnant within three or four days of arriving on shore, they give birth to a pup that weighs about 75 pounds. The female weighs about um, 800 pounds. 26 days later, this little guy is 50% uh, fat. Mom has lost 25 percent of her body mass and the pup has gained 50 percent of the mass lost by the female. And you can just see how much you can always tell behind the neck they they have a divot and back here you can just get an idea of how much weight they have lost. And then you can see this little guy has uh, lanugo which is the natal pelage that they're born with and then about a month after being weaned uh, they look like this. So mom comes ashore gives birth to the pup you can see Here's uh, the winter time, the breeding season is January to about March. So that 26 day window of, of lactation. Female goes to sea for about two and a half months, leaving in the middle of winter, coming back in the middle of spring. She then goes and molts. So she sheds the, the pelage and skin completely. I'll show you a picture of that. They then go to sea for a very long period of time, about eight months, and then come back and start all over again. So there's a two and a half, two and a half month trip to sea and about an eight month trip to sea. The implant, these guys are pinnipeds. All pinnipeds have a delayed implantation. So it allows synchrony of the breeding season with the um, pupping season with the, the uh, breeding season such that within four days of the female leaving the colony when this little guy, right around this period of time is when the females uh, breed. When they come into estrus a few days before they leave. The other thing is that the pup has to learn how to be an elephant seal completely on its own. Mom does everything on the beach and then leaves. So anything about being an elephant seal has to be programmed into this guy. There's no ability for the mother to give the pup any clues and any tips on how to be an elephant seal. 
So the males come ashore first and they fight for dominance to develop uh, these harems, these dominance hierarchies. This is a fight between two alpha males. Uh, males can have 30 to 40 females in their harems and only about 10% of the males ever really get to breed. So females come into reproductive maturity about age three to four. Males may be physiologically capable of breeding probably by age five, but it isn't until about age nine that they actually are socially capable of holding a territory and then breeding with females. I would mention that this fight is a particularly long fight because they're in the water. One of, when they fight on land, they've got all this blubber, so they're very well insulated and they easily overheat. Uh, a colleague with his graduate student, Dan Crocker, uh, and Amy Norris did a thermo thermographic study where they could see that elephant seals fighting on land would just turn red hot in terms of on the thermographic imager. And so when they go in the water, they're able to cool down and, and whether it's good or not, the, the battles can last a lot longer. So as I said, they fight for dominance to do this. This is a male that's copulating with a female. Notice how thin this female looks. You can see back here, that's a female that hasn't been on the beach as long. Last three or four days, uh, the males copulate with the female. You can see this male and everybody here are females. These little black guys are the, are the pups and the bigger, lighter brown are females. The other thing I like to use this photo for is to show the sexual dimorphism. And so males are much larger than females. And that is all tied up in this. You have to hold a territory, a harem in order to breed. So large body size in males is evolutionary, evolutionarily preferred. Big males can fast longer. They have more fat on board. And on land, obviously, the bigger you are, the easier you're going to have fighting and holding on to that to that harem. This will become important in a minute when we look at where they go. Do males and females do the same thing or do they do something different? Given the fact that these guys are so much larger, they should be able to dive deeper and longer. Uh, but that larger body size means they're going to have to have absolutely more food. So we'll find out in a, shortly that that actually has implications on what they do at sea. Here's the molt. And no, these animals aren't sick. They look like there's some horrible disease going on. But you, this is this, we call it an explosive molt, where they lose not only the hair follicles, the whole skin is shed. So you, you can see the animal shedding that skin. And during this period of time, which is the spring for the females, April, May to June, and the summer for the males, August and September, July, August and September, you can walk along the beach and you'll see these pieces of molted skin laying all over the beach uh, from the animals that, that come ashore and to molt during this period of time. Why did they do that? Well, think about the fact that skin is a living tissue. And when they're out at sea, that skin is, is at ambient temperature, it's very cold. So you need to pump blood to the periphery to, to rejuvenate the skin and to fuel that um, synthesis of new skin. And so it makes sense for them to come ashore where uh, you're in air. Air doesn't, is, water takes 25 times more heat away from the body than air. So coming ashore on land makes it easier to go through this rejuvenation process, this molting period. So I use this slide, I've been using it for quite a while, uh, but it still really sort of sets the stage for what we used to know and what we now know. When I was starting, when I was studying elephant seals, as I said, most of our research was on land. This is what we thought. This is from a textbook in 1990. This is in the textbooks. This is where we thought the range of northern elephant seals were. Basically, along the coast, these uh, these these are the islands at the time that this was published. You can see Vancouver Island was identified back then. This is where we thought we knew elephant seals existed. And because we could fly planes or drive boats around, this is where we thought they went to sea. I remember a colleague of mine uh, who did this work said, you know, we don't understand because we see, we count a, a bunch of animals on the islands, but then when we fly around looking for them or we drive our boats around, we don't see those animals at sea. 
And he said, either they're going somewhere else or they're spending a lot of time underwater. We didn't know the answer to either one. But once we put tags on, on these animals, we found out that they only spend about 10% of their time at the surface. And not only that, that when they leave the islands, they go out and they're using most of the Pacific Ocean. And so it just shows you that this is the classic, we, we looked for elephant seals where we could, but when we put tags on them to allow them to tell us where they went, we found out that they did something very different because, just because of the tools we used to study them. Now in this figure, you can see red and the red lines are what the males do, the yellow are what the females do. And I'll get back to that in a second. But this is what we did in the mid 90s when satellite telemetry was just becoming of age and we put the first satellite tracking devices on elephant seals and we got, we were really quite excited. We were chuffed at the fact that we, we got some 50 males and females. More recently, under a program called Tagging of Pacific Predators, Barbara Block from Stanford and myself and Steve Bograd from uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, funding from the, the Packard Foundation, the Sloan Foundation and the uh, Gordon Moore Foundation, we were able to put many more tags out and we just started that in 2004 and we've continued doing that ever since. And at the time this picture was done, we had, this is tracks of 250 individuals. We now have tracks of over a thousand females. And so while the general pattern of where elephant seals didn't change, our understanding about what individuals do and how they change with the oceanography of how they change with age really, really changed, really increased. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the lecture. Here is uh, an animation. The, again, this beauty of, of working here at Santa Cruz, we have elephant seals half an hour up the coast. Undergraduates can help us with our research, graduate students. And here's a female with a tag. And you can see these little worms. When the, the, the line is long, that means the animal's moving rapidly. When the line is small, it means the animal's not either not moving at all or not moving very fast. These are all females. And you can see we have some leaving from here from San Benito Islands, and all of these are from uh, uh, Año Nuevo. There are two trips to see. There's the short trip and the long trip. And you can see on the long trip that females are going much further out to sea. And this is the end of a long trip. Now there's breeding season, post breeding. They're not gonna go out as far come back, it's a shorter trip, it's less than three months. Now they're gonna go out further, stay out longer, and then return. This is, this is when they're, the fetus is, is, is growing during gestation. Now they come back, give birth to that pup, go back out to sea to replenish their reserves, come back, again, that's a two and a half month trip. So each one of these is, a, is represents each, every two trips, that's a year. So this is many years worth of data that we've uh, strung together in this one animation. So here's a male elephant seal and it gives you an idea of the, the size of the animal relative to people. Uh, one thing I'll comment on, this is one of our Japanese colleagues. We've, uh, Bray LaBeouf initiated a, a, a wonderful collaboration with a Japanese research by Yasu Naito from the National Institute of Polar Research. And his work and his graduate students have been, we've been working with them literally ever since the early 80s. And they've brought with us, brought with them a, a whole host of really interesting, wonderful electronic uh, tools. And I'll talk about that uh, again as we go. So I said, you saw that males and females do something different. And this is recent work by Sarah Keenley, who is a graduate student in my lab. She finished up last year. And these are tracks of females. And the dots are the, the, where, they're, where they're feeding. So these are tracks of females and these are tracks, these blue are males. So notice that the females are spending about 85% of all the females are feeding out in the open ocean, out in deep water. And all of the males are feeding along the continental, sh along the, the continental shelf uh, of the North, North Pacific. These males are pre predictably benthic foragers. And you can see here is depth time on this axis. These are animals you can almost, in fact, we have mapped the uh, 
bathymetry of, of parts of, of Antarctica by using the elephant seals, the bottom of their dives, because these guys are, are going to the bottom. You can see that flat bottom characteristic to the dive. So these are benthic dives. The animals are diving to the bottom. These are what we call pelagic dives. The animals are going down deep and you see it going back and forth. So they're, they're feeding in the water column on mesopelagic prey. So this is depth in meters. Here's a close up of that. Even when you have females and males looking like they're doing the same thing, you see you get these females coming up along close to the shoreline, you find that it's still different. The males are feeding onto the continental shelf or right adjacent to the continental shelf break, but the females are doing a little bit of that, but still a little bit further offshore. So the females aren't, except for that one, uh, females are feeding on the continental slope or just near the continental shelf, whereas the males are feeding on the continental shelf bent benthically. And this just shows that uh, the, the relationship between the, the foraging pattern between males and females is quite different. So females and males do different things and it all comes back to that differences in body size and that whole sexual dimorphism and the polygynous breeding system. I could go into to what drives that, but it's, it's all these differences in the size of a male and female have to do with their breeding system. And that makes them to be most efficient, do very different things in the ocean. Now, one of the interesting things is that males, if you look at how much mass they gain at sea and how much time, if I go back here, how much time they spend feeding, they're doing incredibly well. Males are gaining much more mass than females, but they have to because they're larger. The question comes, well, why don't females feed in the same area that males do if that's such a, a beneficial strategy? Why do females spend all their time way out here in the North Pacific and only a few of them come up along shore? What Sarah did is she looked at when our tags go off the air and we've now the technology is so good that tags rarely fail on their own. They've, we know how long they should run so we can predict when the tag stops transmitting because the batteries went out. We also know that the voltage and the quality of the transmission changes. But when a tag just is transmitting along, transmitting along and then goes off the air, we're now pretty confident that that animal died. And we know this because sometimes tags will go off the air and then but we'll see the female come back on the beach. So we have a number of checks to, to suggest that these animals really are, uh, when the tag stops transmitting, the animal has in fact died. If you put the point over which that happens, the females go off the air sort of almost anywhere. They go on the, typically on the way back, sometimes on the way out, but males go off the air almost exclusively along these coastal foraging areas with a few exceptions. This shows the frequency, males are pretty much dying on the continental shelf, females throughout that range. What is it about the continental shelf? Well, we think that this is, a, this is where the predators are, including white sharks and killer whales. We know that killer whales and white sharks take elephant seals. We don't know how many, but this would uh, suggest that, again, this breeding strategy, because males only one in 10 males breed and you have to be really big and fit, there's a very high premium to going and growing fast. And if you don't do that, if you're a small male, you're not gonna breed. So you're not gonna put any genes to the population. Females, all they have to do is survive and they will breed. And so for them taking this less risky strategy where there's sufficient resources for them to do what they need to do, they're going to take the safer strategy. Males are going to take the riskier strategy. Okay, I'm now going to focus on females because we've part of it is, is more males die at sea, and so we lose our instruments. One of the things that has made our, our made it possible to put so many to get so many female tracks is that we get our instruments back and we put new batteries in them. And so we've put a lot of effort into studying females. Also, it's the females that, that reproduce and produce pups. So understanding what drives the ability of the female to reproduce or not, and be able to invest energy into their offspring becomes very important. We want to know what it is about the ocean and how the females are using that environment. I mentioned this earlier, here's a female who is pregnant. She hasn't pupped yet. 
you can see how robust she is. And here's a female that's just leaving to go to sea. This gal is hungry. So she's got to go out and find food. I already showed you this. This was the uh, post breeding, that shorter trip to sea. And this is the post molt, that longer. This is about an eight month trip to sea. This is about a two and a half month trip to sea. This is a very constraining window of time because the female has to gain resources sufficiently to regain her weight. When she comes back onto the beach to molt, she also implants that embryo that's been floating around inside of uterus, uterus finally implants, and then she has a nine month gestation period. So over the course of the talk, I'll probably be going back and forth between the post breeding and post molting trips. I've showed you where elephant seals go. Now let's talk a little bit about how deep they dive and the timing of their dives. When the animals are going and doing those pelagic dives, those, those open ocean dives, they go through this, what we call a deal pattern, a diurnal pattern. They're shallow, they're diving shallower at night and deeper in the water. So at night, about 456 meters shallow, and shallow, right? And 619 meters on average uh, during the daytime. The maximum depth we have for northern elephant seals is 1,735 meters. That's more than a mile deep. And the maximum depth is uh, 516 meters. I mean, the, the mean is 516 meters. How does an elephant seal compare? Well, here's 600 meters. And this is the highest, highest building that I think is in uh, UAE. And it's, no, it's in the Kingdom Tower in Saudi Arabia. It's a thousand meters, that's 3,280 feet. And no, it's, well, yeah, the, the elephant seal is diving significantly taller. You have to add a thousand meters to get how much, how much deeper than the tallest building on the planet, how much deeper an elephant seal is feeding. So it just gives you an idea of diving well beyond this tower uh, is a pretty incredible thing. All right, 1,750 meters. The longest dive we have is an hour and 43 minutes. This is a pretty spectacular dive. And what is amazing about it is that I didn't tell you on average, typically they dive about 20 to 25 minutes with a two, minute, two to three minute surface interval. So the typical dive is 20 to 25 minutes. An hour and 43 minute dive is not typical. It's very atypical, but it's, it's can you imagine holding your breath for an hour and 43 minutes? What is amazing about this is that here's a, an hour and nine minute dive, an hour dive, a 51 minute dive, an hour and 43 minute dive, an hour and 10 minute, 59 minute dive. Each dive is just separated by about two minutes on the surface. So if you figure out how much time this animal from two o'clock to midnight, it's about 20 minutes of time that the animal is spent at the surface. We still don't understand how they do this physiologically. We've got some ideas. Um, they're really cranked down their metabolism. They have a tremendous oxygen storage ability. 20% of their body is blood. And that blood has a much higher amount of hemoglobin, has more red blood cells. 65% of the blood is red blood cells compared to about 40% for us. They also have myoglobin in their muscles, which stores oxygen. So have like an internal scuba tank. And they're very, very good at what they do. So they can really put down their metabolism. But even that makes it hard to understand. So there's some other tricks uh, that they're, they're doing here that we find quite interesting. And one of these days, we'll sort it out. How do elephant seals compare to other marine mammals? Well, they are the deep. Here's elephant seals, Morunga here. They are the deepest diving seal. They're not the deepest diving marine mammal, but they're certainly holding their own. The deepest diving mammal are sperm whales and beaked whales. And so these are beaked whales, Xiphius and Mesoplodon. Uh, you can see here, that's a 1500 meter dive. These guys are routinely operating between 1000 and 1500 meters. So these guys are really uh, the world record holders. Here's a Pfizer as a sperm whale, also diving uh, deeper and, and longer. We could get into the interesting story of sperm whales are bigger, the bigger you are, the better diver you are. You can see some really differences between 
Uh, these guys only make a couple of really deep dives. Sperm whales are able to knock off many deep dives, but uh, interesting physiology there. Here's a pilot whale diving to maybe 500 meters. Here's killer whales, very shallow surface diving animals. And Antarctic, this is a, a first seal Arctocephalus just basically skimming the surface of the ocean. So elephant seals are pretty, pretty phenomenal divers. And the other thing to notice is they're pulling off dive after dive after dive after dive. These guys are continuously diving. Okay, so remember we talked about the female is going to see and having, we have this implantation, the blastocyst implants into the uh, uterine wall during the molt. And then over that eight month period of time, the animal is gestating. The female comes onto the beach, gives birth to that pup. This period of time, she is just feeding for herself to recover, to be able to implant. Is there an effect of this fetus growing inside a mom? Does that, that fetus is gonna require oxygen as well. What we're able to do is Louise Huckstadt went through our data set and we have females that came back without a, without a pup. And if you look at what the difference in the diving pattern between females with a pup and females without a pup, you find out here's the dive duration on this ax, it's a little hidden there, but here's the dive duration and here's the day of the trip. So they leave the beach, implanted, the uh, implantation has occurred. Nothing, they're diving very similarly in terms of the duration. The non, about here, which is about, I think the beginning of the third trimester, I'm not really sure, but close to that point. The non-pregnant females continue to increase their diving duration, whereas the pregnant females start to level off. And this makes sense because that fetus is growing and becoming larger and larger, and that fetus now has its own oxygen requirements. And so we see the difference that the female is feeding for herself and carrying oxygen for herself and the, and the fetus. What is cool about this is that we now have a way that without even looking at the animal, if we have our dive records, we can predict whether a female is pregnant or not based on her dive duration. And we have females that come back and they spend on the beach more than two or three days and they haven't pupped. We've often had arguments as to whether or not the female's about to pup or not. We go back and look at their dive record. And we go, oh yeah, that, that female's not pregnant or, oh, that female is pregnant. Let's give her another day or two um, before we, we go about weighing her and checking things out to see how she's doing physiologically. So we can. this is a really good index of whether animals um, are pregnant or non-pregnant. Early on when we did this work, we got these dive patterns and we, we looked at these dive patterns and you can imagine animal diving down and then moving up and down through what we consider a, a, a school of fish, a school of squid. And you can think about the animal chasing up and down through these bottom of these dives. And so that's what we speculate. That's why I put these little fish here. We also got, and this is Yasuo Naito brought this to our attention, we with these dives that the animal dives to a point, then stops, and then sinks. And we put accelerometers on here. We know the animals are not swimming. They're just sinking like a leaf. And they go back to about the same point each, each time, and they do these uh, drift, we call these drift dives. We don't entirely understand what these drift dives are, but they're either sleeping dives. The animal, you wonder when they sleep. Well, we think they're sleeping during these dives. We also think that these are when they are processing the prey. These dives typically follow a series of feeding dives. And so think about your big turkey dinner. What do you all wanna do after a big meal? You wanna go and sleep. So we think that one of the things that's happening is after this period of foraging, because remember, they're, where, when did they put the oxygen into the GI tract to process the food that they've eaten? They're putting all of, they're getting oxygen up here they're not sitting at the surface reoxygenating their blood. They're, they're using stored oxygen. It's probably going to drive the muscles. So I suspect that the GI tract's not getting much oxygen. We think that what's happening here is that the GI tract is getting, instead of the oxygen going to the muscles, because now the muscles aren't moving, they're not working, the animal's just drifting through the water, the animal is processing its prey. Now people ask, well, does it preclude sleeping? No, they're probably doing both. They're sleeping and digesting the prey. 
can we tell the difference? I have, Terry Williams and I have a graduate student in our lab right now that has developed a EEG recording device that we <clears throat> have used on animals in the lab. And we hope to be able to put this device out on, on, on free ranging elephant seals to see if in fact this is, if they're going through the sleep cycle here. So electrophysiologically studying the animals to see if they indeed are sleeping uh, over these periods of time. Now, the other thing that's really cool about these drift dives is when the animal goes to sea, here's that it, it's actively swimming and then it stops swimming and starts to drift. And if you think about it, the, how much you drift is directly related to your buoyancy. And so in these animals, uh, the buoyancy is such that they're negatively buoyant, so they drift, they drift sinking rapidly. But when they get fat, and if they get fatter, fat enough, they will now become positively buoyant. And in fact, we do that. We see that in some cases they have reverse drift dives where they start, they sink, they go to a point and now float up instead of sinking down. This gives us a measure of how the animal is doing while it's at sea in terms of how much uh, food it's a, a gained. We use that where we looked at these drift dives to figure out where elephant seals are doing their best in terms of where they're feeding. And this work that Patrick Robinson did, who's now the Onion Oil Reserve Manager, did for his doctoral work. You can see these tracks that we've talked about, the, the post-breeding and post-molting trip, all the trips together. Here's where those drift dives are occurring. The animals are transiting, so they're losing mass here, so they're sinking more rapidly. They come out here and wherever it's warmer colors, darker red, is where the animals are gaining fat. And so these are the areas of the ocean where the animals are increasing their fat content. And this is transit rate is another where the animals are slowing down. So remember, I, in those little squiggles, those little worms, there were where the worm was quite small, the animals are very moving very slowly. That corresponds reasonably well to the regions of the ocean where they're getting fatter. Now, this gets back to my comment about our Japanese colleagues. And that was where we took the story in terms of where they feed. And Yasu Naito said, hey, I've got a jaw accelerometer. So right here you can see glued underneath the jaw of an elephant seal is a little accelerometer that measures the characteristics of the jaw movement. And we'd calibrated these so that we knew what a feeding dive, a, a movement of the mouth that was associated with feeding. This little instrument would process the pattern of the accelerometer event and then log when that event happened. And so it gives us data showing the diving pattern of the animal here. And these little red dots are when the animal opened and closed its mouth in, an, in a feeding attempt. Remember I said we thought these were processing dives. We get no, where the animal's just sinking, we don't get any job movement here. The bottom of these dives is where we thought the animals were feeding. And yes, that's where they're feeding. There are occasions where they have uh, a feeding attempts on the upside or the downside of a dive but pretty much most of the feeding is done at depth at the bottom of these dives. And this is a nice 3D image showing the track of the animal coming from Anya Nuevo. Those are seamounts in the background. You can see the uh, drift dives. These are those drift dive segments. And you can also see the, the, the change in, in the depth of these dives as the animals follow the, the prey up and down through the water column. So what do they eat? Well, up to this point, most people would, what, the way we figured out what they ate is looked at their feces. Well, there was nothing in their feces. Everything was, was digested. So we pumped their stomachs and we'd find lots of squid beaks. Well, the problem with that is remember these guys are out here feeding and it could easily be a month or more before they come back. And so anything you get in their stomach is not necessarily gonna be representative, especially not representative of things that are easily digested. Squid beaks are not easily digested. So it's not surprising that we saw a lot of squid beaks. So I had a graduate student, Chandra Getch, who uh, wanted to study this. And so she working again with our Japanese colleagues who do these fishing boats and training uh, the fish. It's a, it's a research vessel that trains uh, fisheries researchers. And what they did is they got on a boat and, and Kodiak, Alaska, and then went to the elephant seal foraging grounds. And where these little uh, stars are is where they put nets in the water and, and trawled at 600 meters of water. 
These are tracks of elephant seals at the time the ship was in the area. You can see the tracks of known elephant seals that were feeding. So they were putting trawls in the water in, at the time and in the place that elephant seals were feeding. And here's showing the vessel. Chandra was there and found this amazing array of, of organisms. We knew these things were out there. The reason she wanted these samples is she needed to get a library of the fatty acids that are in each of these different prey. We, we, always, we talk about essential amino acids, we talk about essential fats. If you get omega-3 fatty acids as a food supplement, you know, the, the krill oil or the, the, the uh, it's good for our heart, omega-3 fatty acids have all kinds of medical things. Well, that we have to get that in our diet. We don't produce that kind of fat. We can produce some fats, but there are certain fats which we can only get from our diet. By looking at the various prey items in the ocean, we can match the lipid content and the kinds of lipids and the profile of lipids that we find in these various organisms and then match that to the lipid profiles we find in the blubber of our elephant seals. And what we found is that this was what we find the fats that are associated with these critters. This is a lantern fish and this is a bathylagid smelt. I don't know what that is. It's one of those, um, these are squids. We found that yes, they feed squid, but they mostly feed on these fishes. And these lantern fishes and these bathylagids are small, but very lipid rich. They're also, this is one that came up, they're very fragile, these little lantern fish uh, midshipmen, they're very fragile. And so it's not surprising we never saw these in the stomachs of elephant seals because they, they fall apart quite rapidly. So they're probably also very easily digested. So we now have a better idea of what elephant seals feed on. Coming back to our amazing Japanese colleagues, they came up with a camera that we could put on elephant seals. And this just shows you some images, uh, 10 seals over 29 hours of video, 1,275 different organisms were observed, mostly fish, some squid, and we saw some other things. And so this, what's beautiful is that the, the photographic evidence confers now with our fatty acid data. And here's some actual images from that, uh, some videos from that, the cameras on the elephant seal. This is a elephant seal. This is a whisker. You want to see that again. So these are whiskers. This is the nose of the elephant seal. So the camera's mounted on its head. Got that fish. This is feeding on a squid. Again, here's a whisker. Squid. Here's, you guys figure this one out. We don't know. Something. I don't think it eats this thing. It just, or maybe it did eat that one. We haven't figured out what that was. Here's a shrimp that just flies by. And a jellyfish. Don't worry about that noise. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, that was a jellyfish. So we, the other thing that was cool about that camera is how do you get video if an animal's at sea for three months? If an animal's at sea for three months, how do you have three months of video? You can't. So they came up with a system where the camera only turned on when the animal went below 200 meters and it was tied into that jaw feeding device so that it only turned on when an animal started feeding and it only did that at depth. So what we found out is that there's some different patterns in where the animal dives relative to the food. This is what most animals look like. Still, that's pretty darn deep, 400 to 600 meters with some dives down a little bit deeper. But there are some individuals that have a much deeper consistent dive depth. So these are the maximum dives of these animals. I mean, the bottom of each dive. And so there are some females which tend to be larger females that are consistently diving below 800 meters. Through the camera that we have on, on that our Japanese colleagues provided with us, we were able to see that when they feed down at those depths, these are pictures of a fish that seems very lethargic. This is frame after frame that the fish isn't doing anything. 
and here it is again. There's a feature in the ocean called the deep scattering, I mean, the uh, oxygen minimum zone. And it's an area where due to the qualities in the physics and chemistry of the ocean, there's very low levels of oxygen. Some fish go there to hide from predators because if you're a gill breathing organism, you're not, you're not gonna be able to, to move very fast. And so if you go into the oxygen minimum layer, you can sometimes hide. You're not gonna hide from an animal like an elephant seal. You're not gonna hide from an air breather who goes to the surface and brings their oxygen with them. They don't care what the, the, water, the oxygen levels of the ocean are. So here's that uh, showing the depth of the dive. The video starts at the bottom of the dive. You can see those feeding events and they were able to measure the, the size of the fish. And what they found is that when animals were feeding down here, they were larger fish than what they were feeding on here. They made fewer dives because they're larger fish. And also this is an area of the ocean which is in that oxygen minimum zone. And so this again shows it a slightly different, most of the dives are in that, uh, this is where the mctophids and bathylagids are. There's a different kind of fish that's found a little bit deeper in that deep scat, in that oxygen minimum zone. And so it, we're now developing instruments that will tell us the oxygen content as of the ocean as the seal is diving. So we know in the oceans in general where these oxygen minimum zones are. We're now going to have a tag that we put on elephant seals that records the diving behavior, records the feeding behavior, and records the oxygen content of the water. So we can really fundamentally show whether this pattern is associated with the oxygen minimum zone. Now, we said they feed on squid. And uh, one of the things I talked about earlier is climate change. And these are data from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, from the Monterey Bay, Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. They have these long-term records with ROVs that are looking at things in the ocean in Monterey Bay. And this shows the uh, appearance of, of uh, pollock in the bay. So these are uh, the amount of pollock that they saw in videos. This is the uh, El Nino index. So this is when it got really warm. 1998. These, this is the occurrence, the observations of this guy, the Humboldt squid, the, the Sodicus. It's a big squid, you know, like a more a feet, one to two feet long squid, very voracious animal. We know that these guys first appeared in Monterey Bay in 1998 and 99. We had a warm water event in the mid 2000, 2004, 2005. The occurrence of these guys was much more frequent we had an elephant seal that did something we'd never seen before in 2005. During this period of time that Mbari says that there's more of these large Humboldt squid in the bay. Remember I showed you all those tracks going way out here and going up here. None of those tracks ever stayed within the California current. This was the first time we ever saw that. And first we actually thought we, we misidentified one of our tags. We put a tag on us with the time we're also doing sea lion tracking. And this animal never left the California current and it's spent most of its time right here. So that's Moss Landing, uh, Santa Cruz is right here, Monterey is here. The animal sort of went out to sea and then came back and spent most of its time feeding right there. That's where the fishers were getting, people were fishing on Humboldt squid in Monterey Bay and that's exactly where it was. This shows that track in, in more uh, open three dimensional space a female elephant seal. I remember saying, okay, this animal's really screwy. She's got to be a, a, a young female that doesn't know what she's doing. Seven-year-old females is prime age. I made a prediction. Okay, she's doing something really bizarre. She's going to have a really bad mass gain. She had one of the best mass gains we've ever had. So this was one smart female doing something we'd never seen before. If you take the, the depth the depth plot of where you find Humboldt squid based on those Ambari observations, and you plot our female elephant seal to see where she was diving, that pattern completely matches up. So we don't know that she was feeding on Humboldt squid, but it sure looks like she was able to make take advantage of that influx of these Humboldt squid. I subsequently went to a meeting in Baja, California, in La Paz, and I listened to our Mexican colleagues telling, telling us about Humboldt squid. And it turns out that this Humboldt squid are very well known in off Baja, California. And in these warm water events, 
the squid are moving up into central California and along the California uh, coast. We have elephant seals that forage, that come from Guadalupe Island, San Benito's Islands. And that's where Humboldt squid are at their prime. That's prime breeding habitat for Humboldt squid. We had been, we had put satellite tracking devices on elephant seals from San Benito's Island. And for the first time, we got all of these females feeding along the continental shelf. And at the time, I had no clue what was going on. When we put together that one female that fed on Humboldt squid in 2005 and the realization that this is prime Humboldt squid habitat, we realized that this may be a more normal behavior, or at least elephant seals can take advantage of this uh, very interesting, very large, high quality prey item. Okay, let me check on. Moving right along, uh, if we talk about we put all these tags out on females and we started to look at repeat females. So these are females that, these are different. These are three, tra three years in a row, the female did the same thing. Two years in a row, the female did the same thing. Three years in a row, she kind of did the same thing. We start, we then ask the question, is this common? How does this, what is this happening? We did by accident, we, one of my students misread a tag and accidentally, one of these great serendipity, we had tagged a female in 1995 as a six-year-old. He misread the tag, put, a ta put our tracking device on, a on the same female 11 years later. So this is the track of the female as a six-year-old, that same female 11 years old as a 17-year-old. We wouldn't normally put a tag out on a 17-year-old. She was fine and she actually continued to breed several years after that. This is an amazing example of site fidelity. So what, what's going on here? Well, let me go back. Um, this shows the variation in chlorophyll This in the ocean. This shows the variation in the ocean where we have sea surface temperature. Females that have high site fidelity go to areas in the ocean where their things are very constant. So the chlorophyll is very predictable. These females have high site fidelity. The sea surface temperature is very stable. It doesn't change from year to year. This is the 10 year average. So females that have high site fidelity are going to a place where they know what things are going to do. Females with low site fidelity, they're, they're sort of averaging out, going over the ocean, looking to see what's, what's going to happen. Females that have strong site fidelity do well on average climates, so that on the average things are going well. When we get into much more variable climate, a variable anomalous conditions, these females that are sort of checking out the larger environment do quite well. What this tells us is that this, as, as we're getting to climate change, this behavior of figuring out where it's going, where things are good and sticking with it probably isn't going to work. So these females won't do so well. These females that are able to change their behavior, just like that humbled squid feeding female, are the ones that are going to be uh, able to have pups and to support the elephant seal population in the future. The good, note, good news here is that there is flexibility in the behavior patterns so that elephant seals are likely going to be able to respond to the changing habitat as this environment, as climate changes. One of the things we're interested in is does personality, is this a risk averse female and is this a risk tolerant female? does this map onto other traits of personality? And, and that's a whole nother story that we're looking at. I'm gonna to start to wrap it up. I'm, I think I'm running out of time anyway, but I keep, we, we mentioned these changes in ocean conditions. And remember we've had these warm water events, these, these warm, uh, we had the, the blob out in the North Pacific. This is that region where it was warming and that anomalously warm period. Uh, my student, Rachel Holzer, who is just finishing her, dissert her dissertation. In fact, she's giving her dissertation defense next week. If anybody's interested, uh, you're certainly welcome to, to uh, dial in. She's gonna give a phenomenal talk. These animals were, were going through this area. And so Rachel's been looking at how animals respond to this oceanographic event, as well as using tags on elephant seals to map out the characteristics of this warm water event. This shows you the kind of data. This is a track of an elephant seal. It's this darker track. 
you can see that warm water is going, we were able to measure and, and, and map the extent of that. This is a satellite derived image. It tells us nothing about what's happening in the water column. So the elephant seals are telling us this is cold water, warmer surface water, and that's that warm water blob. We were able to see that here's that warm water. This is a diving in colder water. The animals are diving deeper in that warmer water. So you can see the, that warmer water going deeper into the ocean and the animals are responding by diving deeper. Because we have these repeat females, we're able to see how they did from one year to another. Uh, this is a female in 2011 before the warm water event. This is during the warm water event. She was eight years old. Uh, she did a little, uh, the six year mean was gaining 262 kilos, 52%. Uh, and in the warm water event, she gained uh, quite a lot. So here's an example of a female that did uh, fine during that warm water event. She actually did uh, better. Here is a different female that, uh, here's after the warm water event, here's during the warm water event. And during the, the warm water event, she pupped. She didn't gain as much mass as the 2016 uh, more normal, but the five-year mean, she was right in there. So this speaks to the fact that elephant seals can respond to these uh, anomalous changes in the habitat. There are more profound changes in the habitat. Here's the 1983 El Nino event, the 1998 El Nino event. In those situations, here's mass gain. Uh, mass gain was lower in the ENSO event, and here's the normal mass gain dropped during the El Nino event. They, the mass gain dropped and the time at sea increased. So this is the trip duration during the normal, normal period of time here. During the El Nino event, they spent more time at sea trying to make up for that, um, the fact that they weren't getting as much food. So they're able to deal with these more anomalous warm water events, especially when they're localized, but these large scale oceanographic changes that associated with an ENSO event are, are another story. Rachel's also been looking at what is the long-term trajectory? Remember we said elephant seals started with just 25 individuals, what, over hundred years ago? and the population has been increasing, at some point the population is going to reach carrying capacity. We have over 250,000 elephant seals in the ocean today. And so either we're going to reach carrying capacity due to the animals have established, reestablished themselves, or the climate is going to start to take an effect, have an effect on them. So this, these are uh, distance traveled in the post-breeding trip and distance travel during the, the uh, uh, post-molt trip. Remember this post-breeding trip is short and the animals really are constrained. So they don't have much ability to adjust during that uh, post-breeding trip, the short trip. They have a much longer trip. And you can see that over time from 2005 to 2020, that trip keeps increasing. So this does suggest to us that the population is starting to reach carrying capacity either because of the number of animals or because the climate is changing. We also see that in the pup, uh, pupping rates. This is in the early, in the 1980s where we looked at weanling mass. And so we see the wean, the pup weaning mass uh, declining and then sort of leveling off. The number of pups being born is lower and now it's sort of leveling off. So this suggests that these little guys are being weaned at a smaller mass and uh, because the population is growing. At the same time, we're getting this climate change. So te teasing apart which one's driving it is a little difficult. I'll end with a couple of slides to just show you where we're continuing to go. Beauty of studying the population like this as long as we have is that you start to track, without even trying, you can do it by accident, but we've now started focusing our efforts. We've been, as I said, we started really putting tags out in 2004. So we now have 16 years worth of tagging. These animals start breeding at age three or four. So we now have tracks of the mother and her daughter as an adult. So this is an adult female that is the daughter of this female. And so here's another one. That's mom and that's her daughter. We've also been looking at females at where we have their first trip to sea as a weanling. 
and then subsequently as an adult. And this is work that uh, Roxanne Beltran and uh, a number of other folks in my lab are starting to, to really focus on to start to understand what, whether these foraging habits are innate, that is genetically programmed, or whether they're learned. And so we're just starting to work on that. So I'll leave it at that. I've probably used up most of my time. In fact, I, I have. And if there's time, I'll take questions. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, I know we're the time. <laughs> we've got we've got a few questions, and I, I'd really like to get to a few of them because there are a number of questions. So for folks that need to check off, I know we're at the eleven o'clock time, but if it's all right with you, Dan, we'll just take maybe three yeah, more. Yeah, I'm I'm good. Okay, so uh, for those of you that are clicking off, just please remember that if if you can and you're able and you're feeling excited and energetic about this presentation and the day in general, um, please um, make sure to donate to Coastside Land Trust, important preservation work that's being done, your co-side here, um, and also to, to give us the opportunity to, to offer these for, for those of you who are checking into us. So thank you for being here. Um, and also um, share the video if you, uh, we're gonna be answering a couple questions. So um, if you don't get to those now, they'll also be included in the video. All right, um, that aside, a couple of questions. A uh, few people were asking about, so you had talked about how males and females forage in different areas. Does the bulk of their diet tend to differ from male to female? Sort of what constitutes the bulk of their diet, male to female? Yeah, we haven't looked at the diet of males the way we have it with females. We, we do know that males, the, the few observations there are, males tend to feed on, on skates and rays and things that are associated with the continental shelf on the bottom. We haven't done the, the fatty acid study. We haven't put cameras on males. So I sus we suspect that the diet of males is very different than the diet of females, but we, we, just, we just have a little bit of data that, the little bit of data we have, either from stomach contents, from what's actually still in the stomach, and a few observations. Because they're, they're closer to shore, there's opportunities to actually see them coming to the surface like this with a fish in their mouth. So uh, the little bit of data we have strongly suggests that the males are feeding on, on bigger and different things than females. What about lifespan? Is that affecting males? Basic, males don't live as long as females. Uh, males, basically, if you look, and this is work that Bernie LaBeouf did, if you work, look at, at what males do at age nine in terms of reproductive, whether they hold a harem or not, uh, that pretty much says what they're going to, their reproductive output, how many female, females they're able to breed with at age nine is pretty much what they get. Uh, typically, an alpha male, if he holds a territory, holds a harem, and he's a really good alpha male, we typically don't see him the next year. Or if we see him the next year, rarely is he able to hold on to that harem. We did have one male that held a harem for three years in a row, but that's unusual. So overall, males don't live as long as females. They're, they, even by the time they get to age nine, there's fewer males. They're, they have a higher mortality across the board in all age, age classes. Females start breeding at about age to three to four. And it's, it's common to see females in their teens. They, when they get to 17 to 18, that's a pretty old female. We don't get too many much older than 20. Bernie LaBeouf just published a, pa a fascinating paper where they looked at what females are contributing to the population. And it turns out, he calls it super moms. There are some females that that predictably reproduce every year. And there are some females that start reproducing at age three or four, but then either disappear or just stop reproducing. So it looks like our population is being maintained, not across the board, but by a few individuals. I mean, not a few, but there's a number of individuals that are particularly good at what they do. And they're contributing more to the population than, than average. Mm. That speaks to actually another question that was asked. Um, this is sort of a technical question is how, how these marine mammals are feeding while they're holding their breath at the same time. Well, that, that's, that's what's amazing, isn't it? They're, uh, they're, they're holding their breath. They have oxygen stored on board. And so they're, 
the tricks are they're very efficient swimmers. They're, you know, they're, we could talk into the hydrodynamics of how they're built and, and it costs them very little to move through the water. They're very, very good at moving through the water. Uh, that and the fact that they have these super oxygen stores allows them to hold their breath and to be, to be active while they're swimming and chase down prey. That also speaks to the idea why we think the O2 minimum layer is important because if animals are sort of narcotized by being in oxygen low waters, then these animals would have a very easy time um, taking down prey because the prey is not going to be able to swim very fast because the oxygen content of the water. If you're a gill breather, you need oxygen in the water. If you're carrying the oxygen on board, that doesn't affect you. Um. Another question is just, and you've shared a number of these, but if you had something else that you haven't had a chance to share that was one of your the latest eureka moments in research. Well, people always ask us about their navigational abilities. And this is work that Patrick Robinson did. He tracked the paths of elephant seals and these are the great circle routes. And so what a great circle route is the shortest distance across the globe. And you can't do this by using a compass direction. So this, you have to know where you are. And here's, here's the tracks of animals returning to Año Nuevo. So, you know, they're way out here and then they return to Año Nuevo and look at, look at how good they are. I mean, some of the animals may come, no, come up a little north and then probably follow the coast down. But here's an individual from thousands of miles out at sea comes bang right on to Año Nuevo. I mean, the trajectories of these animals is amazing. Animals can make their way back to Año Nuevo. We take animals, we drop them off at moderate, we drop them off in the ocean and they zoom right back. So they know where they are. We think that this is done by uh, using the magnetic fields. And so you look at those tracks, the elephant seals were all coming along this way. The magnetic field, if they can sense the changes in the magnetic field, they can follow those lines back to Año Nuevo. So, this is about as far as we've gotten with understanding their navigational ability, but uh, it, it's not unusual for organisms to use magnetic fields. That's, that's very well known. Uh, how exactly they do it is another question. So suggesting that elephant seals also use a magnetic field is, is really not a stretch. Uh, and uh, here's one of the last ones. Um, how do, the, how do the seals protect themselves against UV radiation when they're molting on the beaches? Is there anything? Interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, and then maybe we'll just do, we'll probably just do a last one. We've got a couple of last ones that have come in. Um, but uh, let's see. Well, they were talking about another question from Lee, who asked a number of great questions, um, is since the great white sharks live on the elephant seals, is there any data on the impact of on, uh, on great white shark population when elephant seals populations were depleted? So we take that the other way around. And that's a really good point is uh, my colleague Barbara Block at Hopkins Marine Station is studying, uh, studying white sharks at Anya Nuevo, and she's constantly, constantly, she's often showing me images of the white sharks that are just off Anya Nuevo. We don't know what the white shark populations uh, have been. We've only recently, people have only recently started studying them and getting some idea of the numbers and where they're going. But white sharks are most common globally where there are pinniped colonies. In, in South Australia, one of the big areas for white sharks is off uh, Dangerous Reef and uh, uh, the area where there's fur seal colonies, the highest populations off South Africa, off Cape Town, there's a fur seal colony. And in California, the, and the West Coast, where we find white sharks most commonly is in the Farallons and Año Nuevo, we call that the red triangle. That's their, their food is, is seals and sea lions. On the, on the East Coast, people talk about the, the gray seals and that those, where the white sharks are most common now are associated with the gray seal colony. So in all of these cases, marine mammals were brought to, the seals and sea lions were brought to very low numbers and then they've recovered. So there is more food available for these white sharks because the marine mammal populations have increased. 
So we don't have data to say that that has happened, but it isn't, isn't difficult to argue that that probably uh, the increased abundance of marine mammals has allowed white sharks to also increase. Some people say that's a good thing. <laughs> hmm. uh, thank you very much. We got to go because we're realizing it's 10 minutes after and we've held you for longer. But thank you so much, Dr. Costa, for making the extra time here too and for a fascinating presentation. You're welcome. All right. And thank you all again for joining. And um, hopefully if you haven't gotten to see the rest of the series, um, the other two videos that we have um, are on our YouTube videos so, or our YouTube channel. You'll see a connection to this one in the follow-up email. But if you're interested in the technological advances that have in the research that's being done out at sea for these marine mammals, um, or just sort of an overall orientation to um, the marine mammals of the Central Coast and um, the effects of climate change, both of those are really fascinating um, presentations that Dr. Costa has been presenting the last couple of weeks. So check those out as well while you're on the um, YouTube channel. And we will look forward to seeing many of you again um, at our uh, celebration of the Coastside Land Trust in December. And uh, we're gonna be doing a monarch. Um, we have a, a Xerxes representative coming in January to speak with us about um, the plight of the monarch, monarch butterfly. So thanks again, Dan. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs>